Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to this Accountancy Age and Avalara webinar, Taxing Digital Products and Services, um, What SaaS Vendors Need to Know. I'm Antoinette Wota, and one of the content producers for Accountancy Age, and I will be your moderator for today. So before we start, I wanted to mention that we will be answering audience questions at the end of the webinar. So please submit them using the chat box displayed on your screen. If you have any technical questions or problems, please submit those through the chat box and support staff members will assist you. Um, I also wanted to direct your attention to the related content section of your console. Um, you will find various links and downloadable content there, which is, um, will direct you to Avalara's content, and it will help support different um, information from today's webinar. Then lastly, um, I wanted to let you know that you can adjust um, your uh, console. You can adjust the various windows to suit your preference, although I would suggest that you keep open both the media player and the, um, the PowerPoint slides, because we will be having some poll questions throughout, um, and they will pop up where you see um, the PowerPoint at this time. Okay, so with that out of the way, let me introduce you to our wonderful panelists. First, we have Stephen Bartholomew. Um, Stephen joined Avalara as a VAT solution manager, specializing in indirect tax compliance. Um, he is integral to his to working with non-resident companies to explore VAT compliance solutions. Um, so welcome, Stephen. And we are also welcomed by Sarah Shears. Um, Sarah is head of the VAT group at Anderson in the United Kingdom. She has a deep indirect tax technical knowledge of across a number of sectors, connecting complex tax technical issues with practical and commercial application. Um, so welcome both of you. We're really excited to have you on the call today. Um, so I'm gonna jump right in here. Um, Stephen, could you please provide us with a broad overview of what digital providers need to know about, about tax compliance as they grow and sell internationally? Yeah, of course. Look, thank you very much, Antoinette, for that um, lovely introduction there. Um, it's great to uh, see everyone. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to kick off by um, looking at some of those key factors that need to be considered. And I think a good place to start is to look at really what, what SaaS is. And that is ultimately it's, it's software that's licensed um, at, uh, on a subscription basis. So if we're looking at different types of digital service that would be in scope, it may be something like a pre-recorded webinar. It might be an e-book. Uh, but it's any type of digital service comes into scope when we're looking at this. Now, one of the key factors that businesses need to be aware of is that B2C and B2B digital service sales are treated very differently. And it's really important that you can differentiate between the two. Now, B2C is typically much easier to um, gain clarity on because if a, a business um, breaches a threshold, um, which in some cases is a nil threshold or is a monetary threshold, for example, Australia um, at 75,000 Australian dollars, a business would be required to register um, in that country. And we'll break that down in more detail in a moment so you can understand a little bit more as to how that works. B2B digital services, however, in many cases are reverse charged, meaning the customer will self-account. So in this instance, um, a country that offers the reverse charge, if you're selling into that jurisdiction, you wouldn't need to register, okay? However, there is the caveat that there are some countries globally that do not offer the reverse charge mechanism. And importantly, a business would need to ascertain whether that is the case. So if that country, for example, Indonesia, does not offer the reverse charge mechanism, you would in fact need to register if you've breached the threshold in that country. Um, so that hopefully gives you kind of an overview of, of the, the treatment of B2B and B2C digital services and an understanding of actually what we're talking about when we say B2C. Great. Thank you so much, Stephen, for that overview. Um, I want to jump right into that difference between B2B and B2C digital providers. Um, could you explain some of the differences and sort of why um, they take place? 
Yeah, absolutely. It's a, it's a really important question because businesses have got to classify that. So again, just to remind you, B2B, in a lot of cases, reverse charged, uh, unless a country doesn't offer it. And B2C, if you breach that threshold, which can be nil in a lot of cases. So if you're looking at um, sales into the EU, the threshold into the EU is in fact nil, um, as is uh, the UK for non-resident UK businesses. Um, you know, you would need to register. So what a business would need to do, they need to ascertain um, as to whether their customer is a business or is a, an end consumer. And that's classified as to whether they are VAT or GST registered. So if they are VAT registered or GST registered, indicating that they're a business, that would help them to ascertain who they're selling to, okay? So they need to understand, first of all, their customer, is it B2B or is it B2C? Great, thank you so much, um, Stephen. Sarah, before you add any um, additional information, I just wanted to point our audience's attention to the poll that we have up. Um, if anyone can fill those out, that would be fantastic. Um, so Sarah, do you have anything to add to what Stephen just mentioned? Yeah, um, <clears throat> uh, and uh, welcome everybody. Thanks for having me. Um, so as Steve mentioned, in the majority of countries, um, a VAT registration is not required for B2B transactions because the customer can self-assess that VAT under the reverse charge. However, there are some exceptions to this rule. Uh, and just to give you a couple of examples, countries that you might want to watch out for, um, as well as as well as well um, the one mentioned by Steve, countries you might want, want to watch out for include South Africa, uh, Russia, Malaysia, and Chile. Um, so the rules can vary from one country to another. And they can also depend on whether or not you have an establishment in that country or whether you are a true foreign taxpayer from their perspective. Um, it might also be the case in some countries that although you don't need to charge VAT on a B2B supplier standard, once you then end up registering as a result of B2C, B2C transactions, you may then need to charge VAT on B2B as well. So things can change if your business changes, if your position changes. So just to keep watching out for that. Again, you may have voluntarily registered in a country and then once registered, you might need to charge VAT when you previously didn't. Um, for example, you might be below the threshold, but thinking I don't want to keep keeping an eye on this threshold. We're nearly there. Let's just register now. Um, so just to draw out a couple of country specific examples, South Africa have got pretty complex rules around here. Uh, so the VAT registration threshold in South Africa is typically a million rand in any um, consecutive 12 month period. And they do have different rules regarding intermediaries. Um, so SARS, the South African tax authorities, their view is that electronic supplies, um, suppliers of services should register for VAT regardless of if they're supplying their services through a locally registered intermediary if they exceed the threshold. So that is different to some of the other countries we'll come on to later. So in South Africa, an intermediary is only deemed to supply services as principal if certain conditions are met. So for example, the supply of electronic, electronic services may be deemed to be made by a platform as intermediary, for example, where the seller is not, re not resident and not a registered vendor. However, if the foreign supplier exceeds the registration threshold, it may then typically be classified as a, as a vendor. And if it then uh, fails to register as a vendor, it can be guilty of an offense. And it would be that foreign supplier that remains liable to VAT on the electronically supplied service in their VAT return. And that is irrespective of the fact that the VAT on those supplies may have been accounted for by an intermediary or agent. So you might start off in a position where your platform is accounting for VAT for you. You then breach the threshold. It then becomes your responsibility to um, account for the VAT, regardless of whether or not they continue to do so. So again, watch out for things as your business grows and as you move into different territories. Um, Chile, you're considered to be making a um, electronically supplied service into Chile if at least two of the following conditions are met. So the IP address indicates it's Chile. The payment method used is issued or registered in Chile. The billing address is Chile or the SIM card has a, a Chile country code. Um, Switzerland is another slight outlier. So if you're already registered for B2C in Switzerland, then you would also charge VAT on 
B2B. So as, as we've said, most countries, there is that distinction between B2B and B2C transactions, but just be aware of others where you may be required to register, even if it is B2B. So it's worth checking the local rules, particularly outside the EU, as you um, expand your business into new countries. Did you want me to um, talk specifically, Sarah, about um, the EU? I think that's probably a good segue to kind of talk about the EU requirements with the, the non-union OSS. Uh, yeah, we can go into that now. Sure. Sure. Um, there's also been a question that's just come up, come through as well, asking obviously if a business needs to register if um, the reverse charge is applicable. Um, no, in that instance, you wouldn't need to. Okay, because again, as Sarah pointed out, your your customer would self account in the instance of a B2B transaction, if that country obviously offers the reverse charge mechanism. Um, so yeah, when when looking at B two C um, transactions, digital services into the EU, um, there's a really great simplification that's been introduced um, from the first of July last year called the Non Union OSS. And specifically, this is going to be for non-resident businesses that are selling into that market on a B two C basis. So rather than a, a, a business having to worry about registering every single country, which could be very expensive and quite arduous, um, the non-union OSS is one single registration that a business would have with a particular tax office. Now, for example, Avalara, we offer um, non-union OSS um, in Ireland and Belgium, uh, with Ireland being probably the most popular tax office to take that out with. Now, with this, all of your sales to cross the 27 member states would be declared in one place to that tax office. And this filing is at a frequency which is quarterly. So on a quarterly basis, you would declare those sales to that tax office. Now, the other really important point to consider for businesses here, we will go into this in a little bit more detail later on, is that you would be required to charge VAT at the point of sale at the rate of your customer's country. OK, and then you remit that VAT to the tax office where you hold your non-union OSS. So, so it's clear, if we look at a little example here. So if you've got a, uh, a customer who is in uh, Germany, you would report that sale on your quarterly non-union OSS return. And then you would charge 19% VAT at point of sale and you would then remit that to the tax office. OK, they then disperse that to the German tax office on your behalf. So it's a really good simplification that enables businesses to access a large market, in this case, the EU, through one registration rather than having to register in multiple countries. OK, now I'm sure the EU is, is a prominent um, jurisdiction for a number of the sellers out there. So again, B2B, the EU offers the reverse charge mechanism so the customer would self-assess. But for B2C, it would in that in this case mean that you would need to charge VAT at the rate of your customer's country and then remit that. And the non-union OSS is a fantastic simplification that enables businesses to do that in one place. So hopefully that gives quite a nice overview of B2C digital services into the EU and the new non-union OSS simplification. I will see if um, Sarah wants to add anything on that. Um, it's something that's very common, Sarah, with a lot of businesses that we work with, you know, certainly such a big, potentially lucrative market. Um, I don't think there's anything that you also wanted to add on that note. Uh, yeah, I think I think you described that really well, Steve. There's nothing for, to, for me to add on that one at this stage. I will come in on to some of the issues we see a little bit later when um, people don't, don't um, register for the OSS or don't register in time or, you know, why it might be beneficial to do so. Um, but no, I think that's a really good overview. Thanks. My pleasure. Great. Thank you, both of you. Um, I wanted to, you, you have touched on this slightly, but um, can you go into some details about different triggers that companies need to keep in mind for B2C specifically? Yeah, sure. And I think this is really relevant, actually, to that question that just popped up, knowing whether it is B2C or not. So. Um, the question around, I think it's around whether the customer, you know, does your customer need to be VAT registered to reverse charge or does that then become a B2C transaction rather than a B2B transaction? How do I know if I'm doing a B2C transaction or not? So I think the starting point really is if you supply digital services and your customer does not give you a VAT registration number, um, then you should treat it as a B2C supply and charge the VAT or equivalent GST due in the customer's country. Um, 
if a customer cannot supply a VAT registration number but claims they're in business, but they're not VAT registered because, for example, they're below their country's VAT registration threshold, you can accept other evidence of your customer's business status. Um, <clears throat> so if it's a small entity that's not VAT registered, but they would be eligible if they were over the limit, they might give you something, you can keep that evidence. In the case of an insurance entity, um, like in the, the question that we've just had, whilst the vast majority of an insurance company's services are going to be exempt, they're probably going to be VAT registered anyway um, because they'll be making some taxable supplies. Also, a customer could become registrable by virtue of receiving reverse charge services. So they might receive services in the UK of over 83,000 and then they'd have to register to account for that under the reverse charge. So they would typically be registered anyway. Uh, but if you've got a really small entity or somebody else that, you know, only a small part of their business is business and the rest is, you know, some kind of non-business income or it's a charitable effort or something, they might then not be VAT registered um, and they could provide you some alternative evidence. For example, it could be a link to the customer's business website or other commercial documents of theirs. So certainly from a UK perspective, it's your decision whether to accept alternative evidence that the customer's in business. So you, as the supplier, make that decision. Your customer cannot ask you to treat them, to treat the supply as business to business if they've not given you a valid VAT registration number. There's also um, a little tool, which I'm not sure if you're all aware of, the on the VICE website, V-I-E-S, where you can check somebody's foreign VAT registration number. So if they give you Italian, Spanish, French VAT number, you can look it up and see if it's a, a valid VAT number. Um, so if you've been given a VAT number or some other kind of documentary evidence that your customer's business, in business and you accept they're in business, <clears throat> then the supply doesn't come into scope of the B2C arrangements then. Um, so typically with a cross-border B2B supply, <coughs> excuse me, certainly in the UK and EU, with a B2B cross-border supply, the customer becomes responsible for accounting for any VAT due to the tax authorities in their country. Um, so, yeah, that's one key point. Is it B2B? Is it B2C? Another thing to be thinking about, which we've already touched on, do I need to VAT register? I've now made a sale in Switzerland, you know, Norway, wherever. You need to be thinking, do I need to register there? Um, <clears throat> I know typically we're covering UK and EU today, but certainly Canada and US have some quite complex rules around here, and the US actually have different rules for each of the states. Excuse me, I've got a bit of a cough today. Um, so keeping evidence of your customer's location, that can be another difficulty for some businesses, and we'll talk about that in a bit more detail later. Um, <clears throat> again, VAT registration thresholds, they can vary across the globe. So making sure just because you haven't exceeded the threshold in one country, you may have done in another country. Um, as Steve mentioned before, the threshold is zero in the EU and UK for the... Um, for the MOS and OS. Um, instead of registering for OS, you can actually register in each individual country if you want, but that can obviously be pretty difficult if you are selling to lots and lots of different countries to have single registrations in all those different EU countries. The OS is a great simplification um, if you can make sure you get that set up in time. Another issue we see, obviously, people are selling globally or cross EU on their platforms and it's all going through one place, it can sometimes be difficult to itemize sales per country so that you can pull the required information for your VAT return. So just thinking to make sure you have something in place that you can strip sales out per country to be able to provide that, that level of reporting. I was going to add to that uh, a point there, um, Sarah. I'm sure it's something yeah. you probably come across as well, but a lot of businesses um, also have a... Um, um, will sell a physical product as well as a digital service and that's something that also needs to be considered because they're treated differently so um, we speak with a lot of businesses that are looking to understand well what are the implications if I'm selling uh, an application and a device that goes with it is a physical tangible product so it is also important for businesses to consider what happens if you sell something that is combined physical product but also a digital service yeah, great point, Steve. Um, yeah, absolutely. Around that, the e-commerce rules being slightly different, and is it one supply? Is it two supplies? And I'm, I'm sure we can uh, we can cover that again on a, on a later webinar. If, absolutely. If great, thank you. So before we move on to our next question, 
I actually wanted to um, go back to the poll that we have right now um, up for our participants. And the question is just surrounding what the dominant marketplace is um, for our current attendees. And so you can see here that it's actually really good that today we're covering EU because most of them are in the EU. But then we also have a couple who say they are global and then there's APAC. So that's really interesting. Thank you so much, everyone, for participating in that. Um, for those of you who haven't participated but would like to, I'll go back and um, keep that poll up there for you to complete. Um, yep, yeah, so uh, on to our next question. Um, Sarah, I'm going to ask this one of you first, if you're okay to, to answer. Um, in your experience, what are some of the larger problems companies have faced when they did not approach tax compliance proactively? Yeah, that's a good question. Thanks for that. We have seen quite a number of different issues. So just to give you a bit of a war story without scaring anybody. Um, so we had a, <laughs> a US client, actually, which had a really large VAT liability prior, prior to coming to us. They had a, a large VAT liability, which they'd essentially ignored. Um, and the German tax authorities had come to them and said, you owe us VAT in Germany, you're making supplies in Germany. And the entity was... In their view was that they weren't established in, in Germany. They were a US company. They weren't subject to German VAT because obviously they hadn't taken the advice and weren't familiar with these, these rules. Um, what then happened was they acquired a Dutch company and the German tax authorities actually contacted the Dutch tax authorities uh, and let them know that they had this outstanding liability in Germany. And they actually, the Dutch tax authorities froze the assets of the Dutch subsidiary um, so the tax authorities, they are really starting to work together, not just between corporate tax and VAT, you know, but between countries as well to make sure that the um, the VAT doesn't get lost here. And we certainly, I know Steve's had a number of questions globally from, from tax authorities for some of his clients. Uh, I know we've certainly had questions in from Finland, Singapore, Belarus, Australia. Um, so they are proactively out there looking for this and trying to make sure that people are compliant. Because as you can imagine, some people just haven't heard of these rules at all. And they're, they're, you know, sitting far away from the EU. Maybe they don't have similar rules in their country. They're selling into all these other countries. And then they just didn't realize that there, there was an issue there. Um, so some of the ways that people are, are tackling this in India, payments actually go through the central bank. So the central bank are monitoring payments to see if those payments relate to a digitally supplied service. Um, other tax authorities are, you know, they're out there surfing the web looking to see what you might be able to buy in that country that's um, an electronically supplied service. And, you know, is it registered at their local tax authorities? Is that being charged? <clears throat> and I think we're going to talk Chile again in, in a bit. I think Steve might be have some comments on this. But from the 1st of August, 2022 in Chile, Chilean issuers of credit or debit cards actually need to monitor payments to look out for these B2C digital services to non-resident providers. Where the supplier is not VAT registered in Chile, the issuer of the credit or debit card needs to withhold VAT. So it's you know capturing it at various points within the transaction. Um, the other thing just to be mindful of is that um, when, if you needed to VAT register, typically in most countries, there's no statute of limitation that applies there. So whilst if you're already VAT registered in a country, if you've made an error, there's a, for example, in the UK, there's a four year statute of limitation to go back and correct errors and everything else has gone out of time. When we're talking VAT registration, typically that statute of limitation doesn't apply. Um, so there could be an unlimited going back. So, you know, if in 2030 you realise you should have been registered since 2021, the tax authorities would go back nine years. So it's really important to try and get it right from the start because the last thing you want is nine years' time, someone coming knocking on your door and saying you should have VAT registered in Chile nine years ago and you owe us you know, an awful lot of money because that can be a massive impact on a business. So in terms of compliance, in terms of cash flow, in terms of you know everything, it's just really important to make sure you get it right from the outset. So yeah, did you have Absolutely. anything to add? Did you have, 
<laughs> yeah, no, I think you've alluded to Chile, and it's quite interesting because the Chilean uh, tax office has released a list of um, businesses that are in compliant, um, which has been made very public. So, the other one of the other key issues with with in compliance is the fact that it can affect your reputation, uh, because in this instance, there's quite a few you know well known cust- uh, co- uh, companies that are uh, on that list, um, and that has obviously been made very public. So that's something that's really important to consider. Um, I did just want to go back and just correct one point as well, because I can see that, you know, the EU is a dominant market here. Um, I spoke very clearly about the non-union OSS, which would be for a non-resident business. Um, obviously, if you're within the EU, it's the union OSS. Um, so two variations of the, the one-stop shop there, just for clarity. Um, but yeah, but like I say, I think, you know, going, going back to um, some of the points that Sarah's made, certainly when we're supporting businesses to um, address liabilities they may have, I think it's important to understand that there is a di- big difference between doing it in good faith and doing it knowingly, but also, you know, being communicated to by the tax office to rectify. Um, in that case, you know, you can be exposed to greater levels of fines and penalties than if you do it in good faith. So it's certainly important for businesses to recognise whether they do have any liabilities to proactively regularise their position so they are compliant moving forward. Great, thank you so much. So I want to go into um, examples of what local authorities are doing to proactively seek out VAT non-compliance um, and how they're closing the VAT gap. Do you have any examples of those? I know, again, we've mentioned Chile, but um, if there's any others that you want to kind of mention are working on closing the VAT gap. I know, Sarah, you've got some examples, haven't you, that you've kind of addressed, obviously, so far, you might be able to elaborate on, but I think that ultimately tax offices are communicating more, um, and I think that's an important consideration for businesses that are not ensuring that they're compliant for the sale of digital services. Um, I think because, you know, you don't have the imports to worry about, you know, the the customs and what have you, um, some businesses potentially have not been aware that they do need to, in fact, ensure they're compliant in those countries. Um, So I think it's just important to recognise that, um, you know, globally, tax offices are realising this and they're obviously seeking out to to address that Um, and I think when you're looking at some of the issues with in compliance if a business um, does not have you know compliance in the countries they sell into you know if a a business wanted to IPO for example or they wanted to make an acquisition or you want to sell the company you know all of those factors can be affected if you do not obviously have your compliance globally so it's very important for businesses to consider those factors as well as the fact that you know it can again affect reputation if you are not ensuring you're compliant in all of the countries that you sell into. Thanks. Sarah, do you have anything to add? Um, yeah, I, I mean, yeah, it's just it's just really important to, to make sure you get that compliance right. Um, I guess one other thing I was going to add, I don't know if anybody's in this, this industry uh, here, but once we get into kind of crypto assets and NFTs, non-fungible tokens, a lot of that would be seen as a electronically supplied service or a digital service. There can be huge issues there in knowing who your customer is, where your customer is and we come on in a bit to knowing where your customer is but another thing that tax authorities are that we are starting to see um you know if people are saying oh i don't know where my customer is so i'm not going to account for that then you know we are seeing some of the tax authorities saying well you might not know where your customer is but you're based in switzerland or your platform's based in switzerland so we're going to have that in switzerland on all of your supplies unless you can prove otherwise um so you know yeah they are all working together to try and come up with means of making sure that everybody pays VAT and pays the correct VAT in the correct territory where possible. Great, thank you so much. I'm going to move on to um, one of our last questions here. Um, And that question is, what can digital service companies do to better navigate tax compliance as they sell across borders? Um, So any advice there for for the our audience today would be fantastic so i think that actually fits in really well to exactly what i was just starting to talk about there around knowing where your customer is um so yeah you need to know where your customer is Uh, you need to monitor rules and and changes so um in the canadian provinces there's some recent rule changes uh, the Philippines made some, they recently approved a bill imposing 12% VAT on non-resident digital service providers who are engaged in the 
sale of services using digital or electronic platforms. So that bill was passed in September 21. And obviously, there's a, a time then for it to do come into legislation. But it's a it's a moving target. Um, as I just said before, if you don't know where your customer is, there is a risk that the tax authorities in the country you're established in may seek to chart, to argue that all customers, all your customers in that country and charge VAT on it all, or they may use some other means. For example, as Steve said, some people are selling goods and services. So if you're shipping some goods out to somebody, they know exactly where those, you know exactly where those goods went because you had to post them out. Um, so sometimes, you know, people might be looking to use that as a representative sample of where your electronically supplied services are as well. Um, but if we look at a more straightforward example and the one that um, the tax authorities kind of have already provided some guidance on, how do we determine the location of our consumer? Well, as we've said, the place of supply of cross-border digital services is the consumer's location. Uh, which is determined from a B2C perspective, it's determined where the consumer usually lives. So for example, um, for a UK expat living in France, the location would be France because they're living in France. But to try and simplify the rules for some supplies of digital services, you can make a presumption about the place where the supply is to be taxed. So where the presumption applies, you don't need to know in which country the consumer of the digital service resides. Um, so in this instance, the business supplying the digital service doesn't need to get any additional evidence to justify in which member state the VAT's due. So the types of supply that might be covered by the presumption rule include, um, for example, where the digital service is supplied through a telephone box, if anyone still uses them, uh, through a telephone box or a telephone kiosk or a Wi-Fi hotspot, an internet cafe, restaurant or a hotel lobby, um, then that will be due where those places are actually located. So if a Spanish tourist um, goes on holiday and sits in a, makes a call from a telephone box in the UK, then that will be due in the UK. You don't need to go to that second level of detail that actually they were in a telephone box or in a internet cafe or a Wi-Fi in the UK, but where do they live originally? You know, you don't, you can use the presumption rule and you tax it where they used it effectively. Um, so again, onboard transport traveling between different countries, that in that instance, that will be due in the place of departure. So as an example, if an international train charges passengers for using a, a Wi-Fi hotspot on board, that will be due in the place of departure. So you don't need to find out who used the Wi-Fi on the train, where they normally live, where they were going. You just need to know where that train left from. <clears throat> um, and yeah, if it's through a consumer's telephone landline, then that's due where the consumer's landline is located. So if the presumptions don't apply, you need to get and keep evidence to show which country your customer is normally located in. So examples of the type of supporting evidence that tax authorities will accept include um, the billing address of your customer, the IP address of the device used by your customer, your customer's bank details, the country code of the SIM card used by your consumer, um, the location of your consumer's fixed landline through which the service is supplied, or other commercially relevant information. So for example, um, product coding information, which electronically links the sale to a particular jurisdiction. And in the vast majority of cases, you know, people should be able to have this, this type of information. I think the complexities come in, as I mentioned earlier, <clears throat> if people are using crypto, NFTs and things, they're paying through a wallet, which isn't necessarily then registered to the to this level of detail. And so just just an, another thing to um to go through just before I hand back to back to Steve, um, the use of payment service providers. So if you make cross border digital service supplies, you need to get and keep sort of two pieces of evidence, two pieces <clears throat> of information as evidence of where the consumer normally lives. So this shows that the correct rate of VAT has been charged and will be accounted for to the correct tax jurisdiction. So for many sort of micro and small businesses, this, this can actually be quite challenging. Um, so if you are a small business that's using a payment service provider, it, it's worth going to your payment service provider and asking them to, you know, at the point of sale, can they ask the consumer for details of either their billing address and can they please include the country of the billing address 
within that or their telephone number, again, including the country dialing code, so you know exactly where they are. And when the consumer pays for that digital service, um, it's, it's best practice to get the payment service provider to give you the uh, notification advice, which contains the two digit country code of the consumer's country of residence that's in their records. So then if you've got those two bits of information from customer details, from payment details, and they match up, then, then you're good if the tax authorities come along and say, you're based in the in the UK, why didn't you charge UK VAT on this? You say, my customer's in France. They say, how do you know? And you say, here, look, we've got details of their, you know, we've got details of their billing address. We've got details of their, their payment address. Um, and that then is enough evidence typically to give to the tax authorities to um, to make sure that they're comfortable with where the VAT's being accounted for. Yeah, I think there's some fantastic information there, Sarah. I think what I'll do just to kind of kind of summarise there, I think one of one of the most important things for a business to do is to speak to someone that can support them to provide the insight that they need to ensure that they're compliant. So whether it be speaking to a tax advisor like Sarah or speaking to a specialist compliance company like Avalara, you know, we would be able to help you understand what your obligations are in the markets that you sell into. And that's that's vitally important. And We've spent a lot of time talking about thresholds and determining, you know, the type of service you provide. It's really important to do that, and that's where you know um, the likes of Sarah and myself are able to help to support business to do that. Okay, to give you an example, a lot of businesses that are very proactive will obviously, as they start selling or they launch their their digital service company, you know, they will they will come to come to us and ask us for input as to kind of what their obligations are and ensure that they're compliant moving forward. But similarly, if, it, if you're a company that perhaps has started selling that needs to regularize your position for the reasons that we've explained in depth today, um, then again, it's important to, you know, ensure that you're working with people that can support you to become compliant in that area that you sell into. So I think there's, there's a lot of information there. Um, and I think that, like I say, Sarah explained uh, brilliantly there some of the considerations. Um, I think it's about businesses to kind of reflect on what they're doing, what markets they're selling into, um, and ensure that they get the information to help them to become compliant. And you know, I think when you just look at the fact that, you know, typically we work with businesses that sell into a huge range of markets and we're helping them to assess kind of where thresholds have been breached, it, it can be quite vast because the threshold is very varied when you're looking at different countries. Um, like I say, typically nil threshold in some, but then it would be different totals in other jurisdictions. So to ensure that you've got a thorough understanding of that, that can really help to ensure that, um, you know, you've got the compliance that you need to sell um, effectively globally uh, and at scale. Great, thank you so much, both of you. Um, for the audience, I want to just point out that we have one last um, little poll up for you. It says, following on from this webinar, how compliant are you in the markets you are selling into? Um, so while our audience just takes a second to kind of complete that, I was wondering if um, both of you can just sort of highlight one last key point um, that you want the audience to take away from this. Um, and also, I want to just point to our audience that you can start submitting questions if you have any, although we won't be answering any very specific questions, um, but uh, both Sarah and Stephen will be in touch offline um, regarding those very specific questions that do come through. So again, Stephen and Sarah, do you just want to mention one key point each that the audience needs to take away from today's discussion. Would you like to go first, Sarah? Yeah, and if I take the one you were gonna say, you'll have to take the new one. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <No laughs> I think doubt the key you will. point to me is just to, is just to monitor. Monitor where you're selling, monitor how much you're selling, and if you think you're getting close to a threshold, um, either get yourself registered or reach out for help to get registered. Um, yeah, obviously you can, if, if you think, oh, I'm gonna have one customer in such and such a territory, which has got a zero threshold and it's an administrative nightmare to VAT register there, you know, I guess think about, can you, can you block sales to that particular country? I'm not sure, it will obviously depend on your business model. But to me, monitor, monitor your sales um, and monitor that in line with the, the relevant thresholds or reach out and say, hey, I think we're going to go into these territories. When do I need to register? When do I need to ask for help? 
Sarah, you're meant to just give one. So that that was at that least was four like or five. Really you put me, on, you're putting me under pressure, Sarah. <laughs> <laughs> I think I'm going ten if you like, Stephen. Then you'll have to. Uh, <laughs> yeah, you'll just add some more. Make it harder for me. Music. No. Yeah, I mean, obviously, I would echo all of the points there that you've made are really, really important. I think, you know, understanding the thresholds is so key because that's going to determine whether or not you need to register. Um, and I think particularly if you're B2B SaaS, OK, I think it's, it's really important to, you know, consider that some of the countries you sell into may not offer the reverse charge mechanism. So it's just important to consider that, OK? And I think the final point I'll make is that if you do know that you have sold, OK, it's important to regularise your position to ensure that you're compliant moving forward and you're not going to put yourself into um, a position where you're exposed to, again, any potential fines or unnecessary liabilities in those countries. Great. Thank you so much, both of you. So I've pulled up the results from um, this last poll. Um, most of our audience has said no comment, which I sort of expected. But um, I'm very happy to see that about 40% of them say they are fully compliant. So um, that's really good to see. And then about 13.3% are partially compliant. So thank you so much um, for completing that for us. Um, we're going to move on to the Q&A portion of today's webinar. Um, and our first question is for Sarah, and it says, I've already started selling, what do I do? So, um, register. <laughs> uh, so yeah, if you've already started selling and it wasn't just, a, you know, if you're in a country with a zero threshold and you made one random sale, then obviously technically you should be registering anyway. But if you've already started selling, you need to get registered or reach out for help to get registered. If it's a, a belated registration, I think Steve touched on this earlier, <clears throat> but do as much as you can to help the tax authorities quantify what VAT is owed, because typically if you're late registering, there will be penalties and interest charged. Um, so penalties vary from one country to another. Just because I've got Chile in my head from a few times we've mentioned Chile earlier. In Chile, there's interest of 1.5% for each month. The VAT's not reported and paid, and there's fines of between 10 to 60% are also um, can be due. Again, in the UK, there's you know there's a range of thresholds, but the more that you can quantify what you owe, um, and you go to the tax authorities before they come to you, there's normally a step down of levels of penalty, uh, so that will be lower. I think the one thing then just to mention on the um, the one-stop shop, the, the union, non-union one-stop shop that um, Steve talked us through earlier, the use of that scheme is optional. Um, as I touched on earlier, the alternative is you've at register in every country in the EU, which is obviously administratively burdensome. <clears throat> but because the union one-stop shop is a simplification, uh, designed to allow the straightforward mechanism to account for VAT in multiple countries in one return. It's not a particularly sophisticated system. It's not particularly flexible in its operation. So one thing they can't deal with, because they're dealing across all the member states, one thing they can't deal with is any retrospective issues. So a business with sales exceeding the threshold um, has a liability to account for VAT in the member state once the threshold is exceeded. Um, we have you know, on a case by case basis, we have had verbal agreements with the um, tax authorities to include all historic VAT on the first return if it's not going back too far. But, you know, whilst that might be agreed by the country of registration, you might have registered in Ireland and they might be happy for you to stick the last few months Irish sales on your Irish VAT return. They couldn't then bind the other EU member states. So you might have another member state come along like Italy or France or somebody. They could still come along and challenge you and say, OK, great, so you've registered from now and the OS, but I need you to go back and do a Italy registration from an earlier period as well. So typically, the, the one-stop shop registrations can go back to the kind of beginning of the, the month before. But if you do identify um, a need to account for VAT in other member states on cross-border B2C supplies, it is best to promptly register for OS to use it um, Retrospective registrations, very limited circumstances if you've already started. Um, and yeah, so I guess 
I know the question was, I've already started, but you can fall into it and, you know, you might end up in a situation where you need to register in multiple countries instead of using that simplification. So I think that really does highlight the need for businesses to be fully aware of their cross-border obligations and to take the appropriate steps to be compliant. As I say, if it's a retrospective EU liability um, and you're not allowed to use us for that prior period, the only alternative would be to register for that in all member states. Um, where, the, where the supplies have been made, and I think, I think you know, we should try and avoid that if we can, because you don't want to be that registered in that many territories if you could have been in one. So yeah, yeah just to summarise, really... obviously the world's longest answer. Um, but basically, if you realise you should have registered and you haven't already, get yourself registered. Be as helpful as you can with the tax authorities and reach out for advice if you need it. I was just going to add there, Sarah, I think that was a brilliant summary there, but I think also as well, businesses need to understand that when you do have to retrospectively file, you'd obviously have to file the frequency of that country back to the point where you obviously first had the liability. So, um, for example, if you've obviously had two years of sales, unless that country specifically offers an annual return where by which you can do it, you would obviously have to retrospectively file for each period back to the point where you first started selling. Um, so that's important to consider with, with backfiling. Great, thank you. So our next question um, is for Steve. Um, how long does it take to obtain a, um, a VAT numbers? Yes, yeah, a brilliant question. And it's this is so important for businesses to consider, particularly businesses that are just um, launching. OK, so we have a number of businesses that say, right, I'm starting. I want to start at this point, uh, but perhaps haven't taken into consideration how long it takes to obtain a VAT number. Now, there is not one answer for this because it depends on the tax office. OK, so what we do at Avalara, we have um, approximated lead times and that's based on businesses that we have placed in that jurisdiction. And what we do is we average it and we update that on a regular basis to give businesses a rough guide. OK, so, for example, the, um, the non-union OSS or union OSS is, is between 30 to 40 days to obtain um, a VAT number. But when you're looking at other countries uh, around the world, it's you know you can be looking between six to ten weeks uh, before you would actually receive your VAT or GST number. So there is a great amount of variation, and it is important for businesses to consider that. When you're looking at the EU for businesses that might need to retrospectively file in an individual country, to give you an idea on the range here. Um, France at the moment has got a, a, an average lead time of approximately 100 days. Um, you've got Germany, approximately 80 days. Um, but then you've got some countries, for example, Italy with a fiscal representative is 15 days. So there is a real variation depending on the jurisdictions that the businesses are selling into. So certainly it's a really good question, Antoinette, because businesses have to take that into consideration with their planning. OK, to ensure they've factored that in so they understand when they can obviously launch and they can, in fact, start selling compliantly into those markets. OK, um, back to a point that Sarah made earlier about monitoring sales that comes into it as well, because if you are or you think you're approaching um, a threshold again, understand what the lead times are because you know you want to make sure that you've got that in place so that at that point when you breach the threshold, you're ready to start reporting those sales and remitting any VAT due. Yeah, and I think it's also really good point. Yeah, I I think it's also probably worth adding, and I can see actually there's another question come up that that's similar to this. Um, but I think it's also worth adding. You know, it's not just how long is it going to take to get registered in that country, but how long is it going to take to prepare all the documentation I need in that country? So certainly for the us, like you might register in one company, and it doesn't take very long to prepare everything. You might register in another country and you might have to have everything notarized, apostilled. So it could take four or five weeks to get everything signed off by your company, get everything notarized before you can even get to the submission stage. So it might be that the time taken is longer in one country for the authorities to process, but actually the burden of what you need to provide, you can get together a lot quicker. Great, thank you so much for that. Um, so I've got one last question that's um, come in, and I'm hoping we might get a couple more. But um, the question reads, uh, where should we register for non-union OSS? Um, yeah, so there are uh, different countries that offer uh, the non-union OSS. So if you're a non-resident EU 
company and you require that uh, say we use um, Ireland um, mainly one of the reasons is it's, it's um, obviously English speaking um, but like I say uh, Belgium and other countries across the EU are also very popular so it doesn't matter which country um, like I say, a lot of UK based companies will will utilize um, Ireland just for the ease of communication with the tax office okay uh, again if you're using a provider like Avalara um, we would have specialists that speak the local language so we would obviously be able to liaise uh, with that tax office which would take away the potential language barrier or translation barrier but like I say it's uh, Ireland is, is, is the is the tax office that we predominantly register businesses for non-union OSS yeah I think I'd agree with that Steve uh Obviously, it depends where your company is based or where you might have an establishment or an office, or you might want to register where the vast majority of your sales are or where the language is that you speak. Certainly, and we registered in uh, um, an entity in, in in Poland, I think it was, because they had a lot of sales there. And that was one of the ones that needed a lot of paperwork, notarized and everything to get ready, which if you've got a big um, presence there or you've got people there, then I guess people are already familiar with that and having to do that. Uh, but if you're based outside the EU or you're based in the UK or something and you're thinking, which one should we go to? Then typically we find Ireland to be quite straightforward and easy. Yeah, I think that's a good point. And I think that, that yeah, just to reiterate that point as well, again, this is for a non-EU resident company when you're looking at the non-union yeah. OSS. If it was an EU resident company, they would obviously have it with the a tax office in the country that they're establishing and it would be the union OSS. Great. So we do have another question that came through. Um, do you do you have to use an agent to be able to register for OSS in Ireland? Um, you, you don't have to have an agent. Um, if obviously, for example, with the IOS for physical goods, because there's an intermediary requirement, you would need obviously a provider to support you that provides an intermediary service. Um, for non-union OSS, it doesn't require the intermediary or fiscal rep services, for example. So a business can do it themselves. It's up to them. Um, it's whether they want to outsource it or they want to manage it in-house. Um, it depends on kind of time restraints, personnel, um, you know, finances. There's lots of factors that businesses would need to take into consideration when considering that. Great, thank you. So um, we don't have any more questions coming through. So I think um, I'll just round off this webinar. So I want to once again, thank you both of you for joining us today. And thank you for some of those really good points about the different trigger triggers um, for taxation in different countries. Um, so thank you again so much. Um, and to our audience, I hope you uh, found this valuable and found it really interesting as we did. So thank you again, both of you. Have a wonderful day, it's a pleasure. everyone. Thank you, everyone. Yeah, I hope it was useful. Thank you.